You could say like my goals are to make money, but like that's not necessarily everybody's goal. And especially once you have different investors that are coming together to invest in your space, they all have their own different ideas. And so you really see this when you get into the restaurant and bar development is suddenly four months in, some investor is like, by the way, there's going to be a cigar room, right? And you're like, well, we're building a Thai restaurant that's, you know, like, right. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. and, and it doesn't. And the guy says, well, I'm investing a million dollars into this space. What is up? And welcome to No Agenda, where I have my internet friends come teach me stuff. Uh, today, I'm talking to Chris Louder. Man, you see, I can hardly contain myself, Chris, uh, who will be teaching me the three most critical things to know when building a restaurant. Chris, thank you so much for being here, man. Hey, Rashad, it's an absolute pleasure to be on the pod and thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to get going, I'm fired up. I thought of you this weekend, Chris. I was at a cocktail bar uh, and I ordered an espresso martini and it was garnished with, usually it's garnished with the three coffee beans, right? Coffee beans, sure. It was garnished with a lemon peel. Okay. I was like... I couldn't tell if it was intentional. It almost seemed as if the bartender just like, like it fell in and they were like, you know what? We already made it. Like, go ahead and serve this. Is that a thing? Lemon peel on espresso is done actually in some places. It's not very common in the States for sure. Uh, but I'd be curious to try it. You know, a citrusy espresso martini, who knows? Uh, so it goes, yeah. You're pro innovation, not a, a traditionalist when it comes to this stuff, right? We're down to try stuff. I feel like most most people I've talked to in the culinary space usually are. Yes, definitely. I mean, especially uh, having spent a lot of time outside of the States and been exposed to a lot of different cultural traditions. I've spent, gosh, close to a decade living in Asia, um, Japan, South Korea, China, I've had the privilege to visit a lot of bars around Europe. And so uh, that's humbling, right? I find that that perspective can be super useful. And and definitely when we're recipe writing, when we're working with the guys in the kitchen, uh, they're always trying to blow my mind. So I try to stay curious. I love it. Okay, amazing. Well, we'll get into all that. Uh, I want to do a quick background. So I'm, I'm super excited to get into all this stuff. I've tried to condense into the most interesting things, at least for me, a combination of your background, uh, the stuff you've been doing on social media and TikTok, brand building, all that stuff. Uh, but let me share for people that don't know you, Chris, a little bit of background. So Chris is one of the most sought after talents in corporate and multi-venue luxury bar consulting, hospitality development and management. Chris has successfully built globally recognized beverage programs in some of the world's most challenging markets, including China, South Korea, New York. Ones that I recognize are Nomad and obviously the Four Seasons in Seoul. I think you were a, a big part and we'll, I'll let you share kind of what your involvement was there. Uh, and then most recently, you've gone on to co-found your own company, LTH, so Louder Tascarella Hospitality, which is a hospitality consulting firm. I'm sure there's plenty of stuff that I miss, but directionally where we on point, Chris. Yes, it's been a twisting long journey. You've you've got it exactly right. So we'll spend, I think, probably the back half and hopefully the majority of the conversation focused on the topic being, uh, you know, how to how to build a restaurant. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about bars too. I'm an avid goer, never worked in the service industry, but I'm I'm definitely interested to hear uh, a little bit more about the sausage making, but like, I, I want to hear a little bit more about the background and how you ended up spending so much time in Asia because you grew up in Baltimore, went to school in Delaware. How did it turn out such that you spent, I guess this is the, the road less traveled for most Americans. How did you spend most of your time in the, in the East? Yeah, <laughs> got that right. <laughs> Great question. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. I, I went to school in Delaware. Originally, I went to school in Delaware because I was playing in a punk rock band and I just wanted to go to a school that was closest to my home so that we could still play shows and make records. Uh, along that journey, I, uh, got into this university. I got into University of Delaware and had no clue what I wanted to study because I never thought much about it. I was like, I'm just going to make music forever. And then uh, wound up falling into East Asian studies. I said, you know what? Worst case scenario, that sounds interesting. That sounds challenging. That sounds kind of out of the box. And 
worst case scenario, I can travel, right? Like that sounds uh, kind of cool. So I started studying and they had some scholarship programs and I said, whatever, let's just go for it. And I started applying. I got scholarships to live in Japan for three months for a summer to do an internship with the prefectural government in Sendai, Japan, uh, which is just like peon work. You're reading newspapers, but it was super cool, right? You get to live in Japan. And then right on the back of that, I got scholarship to go study uh, translation full-time in Beijing. And so I went to Beijing. I studied at the Beijing Foreign Language and Cultures University, which is a fairly prestigious translation academy. Loved it. Said, look, I'm, I'm not going to go home until I'm fluent. Stayed. Uh, lived there for about two and a half years. Became a translator. Uh, for industrial economics, which I don't necessarily recommend. It's very dry and boring. Uh, and then, and then, um, I grew up cooking actually. So I'm from Baltimore. I grew up cooking in, in a crab house and steaming crabs and working on the line. And I missed that. So I said, you know what? Whatever. I'm going to move to New York and start cooking. Um, and instead of starting cooking, I started bartending and eventually I was. Uh, managing the bars at the Nomad Hotel. And we won America's most outstanding uh, bar. We won several James Beards for the bar program and our cocktail book. Um, and then without going on too long, I got I wanted to go back to Asia and take all the stuff I learned in New York and, and try and apply it and see if I could tie it all together. I moved to Seoul, South Korea, did a year and a half there. And then moved to China to consult on bars full time and distribute and import alcohol. That's what I've been doing for like the last five years. I want to hear more about the transition, this East and West, specifically when it comes to dining and hospitality um, cultures or culture in general. Like, what have you noticed to be the biggest differences having run hotels in New York and in places like Seoul, uh, other places in China? What an awesome question. What is the difference between hospitality broadly, right? East to West is I'll take, I'll tell you first and foremost, um, hospitality is different and the concept of hospitality is different country to country. That was one of the most humbling things that I learned living in Seoul. I showed up, right? Even for all of my cultural study showed up, still had a bunch of trappings of what you might refer to as the ugly American, but just applied to hospitality. I was like, in Korea, so okay, I'll, I'll tell you this. In Korea, um, food is served family style, right? It's a communal eating culture. You don't even get served like beer and soju often. There's a refrigerator in most restaurants. You just go up, you grab what you want, you take it back to the table, you crack the bottles, you pour it for your friends. Oh, interesting. They count the empty bottles at the end and they bill you, right? So I I started getting frustrated with our staff in Seoul because I said I was used to this New York level of hospitality, which is not intrusive, but it's you're trying to anticipate demands before people have them, right? I want to offer you another cocktail. I want to refill your water, right? That's the Michelin kind of idea. In New York, I feel like it's a lot of that. It's like, are you are you done here? All set? And it's like, no, I don't know. Maybe I'm still uh, kind of working on it. Right. Part of service in a Michelin environment tends to be this ethos of the guest has everything they need. They have nothing that they don't need. Right. Whereas in in a lot of other cultures in the world, service is I'm going to sit here with my guests. I'm going to call you over when I want you. And aside from that, I want you to leave us alone to to be with ourselves, you know? I actually do have a pet peeve when when waiters or servers will come interrupt a conversation. We're going deep. I'm I'm reconnecting with friends. I did this in DC recently, big group of friends going on long sort of like life updates. And it felt like every two or three minutes, it was like, no, we're good on wine, we're good on appetizers, bring the check, bring the dessert, whatever. And it's like Guys, I don't know, a bit of sensitivity to what's going on or re reading the situation, you know. That's the marriage between service and hospitality, right? So in, in service, it is the black and white, right? It is the what of what happens in a restaurant or a bar or a hotel. Is the water filled? Is the wine the right wine? Yeah. Whereas hospitality is reading the room, right? That's a way softer skill set. 
And one of the things I've noticed certainly since traveling around and dining around in my consulting work since coming back to the States is after COVID and certainly with all of the cultural transformation and societal transformation that we've had uh, over you know the last decade, um, there is a lot of that hospitality, which is way more of a softer, harder to master skill set, um, is is not. I don't want to say it's not what it used to be. And then you know, I sound like one of those people, but I think I I think there's room for improvement. That's what I can say. Why? Because like QR menus and it became very transactional and oh my God forbid those like iPads that you order from when you're at LaGuardia or JFK or something like that. Like, is that, is that kind of what you mean? The contactless sort of like shift? There's certainly a transactional nature that I think has crept into bars and restaurants and understandably so, right? You've got COVID, you want social distance. And also I think staff are understandably burned out. There's a lot of people that maybe were eight years, 10 years experience in hospitality that really knew how to work that situation. A lot of people have fallen out of the industry too. So you've got like, you've got real um, new situations, whether it's QR menus or et cetera, et cetera. And then that's overlapped with kind of this atrophy of uh, a legacy talent set that is now said, you know, people that are consulting now, people that are doing all these other things. Right. And the restaurants hiring them for three months and then the government says we can't have, you know, restaurants open and then they lay them off and then they bring them out, uh, you know, and there's people just want stability. They're like, I want to know I have a job on this next week. That's exactly right. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Those two things in concert make for quite, uh, I guess, a a challenge in the hospitality. So but back to the East versus West thing, are there I'm, I'm curious in your personal opinion, I guess, are there things that you experience specifically in the East that you're like, oh, we we really fucked this up in America. Like, I wish we would adopt some of this uh, when it comes to dining, hospitality, whatever it is. This is, a. will give you two answers that I'm pretty passionate about that tend to be fairly spicy, okay? Okay. So the big difference between, let's say, hospitality in China versus hospitality in the States does exist right now. Firstly is the QR menu. Um, a lot of people in the States are understandably frustrated when they get presented with a QR menu. And I'd say a big part of the reason for that is that it's clunky, right? It is, uh, I scan this QR, I have a static PDF on my phone that's not giving me any value. I want the piece of paper, right? Why can't you just give me the menu that I can read like a human being it's tactile, it's much larger, it gives me a sense of luxury and experience. The technology in China is a lot more developed than it is here in the States, where that QR menu actually is a tremendous value add. Uh, it's not just a static PDF. I can read reviews, Amazon style, all the dishes could be rated up to five stars. Sure. If the restaurant sees that a dish is like three star, they just kill it off the menu. Like, so it's all killer, no filler when you go to that restaurant because they're getting real feedback in real time from the guests. That's very interesting. Also, it's not, it's not text, it's images. And if it's not images, it's going to be video of the dish, right? So I really understand what I'm about to buy. How often now do you see something on Instagram or TikTok? You go to the restaurant and you're like, hey, I-, I saw this dish. Which one is it? Right. And then you kind of feel awkward. Right. I don't want to be that guy that's that's like trying to have the viral dish. It's a little embarrassing. Whereas in there, you're kind of anticipating that guest need. Again, this goes back to hospitality. How do you use technology to enhance hospitality? Well, I think about this for foreign restaurants. If I go to an Italian place or a French place and everything, you know, I'm not going to be the guy who's like, uh, can you translate this line item or whatever? I'm just going to order it and hope for the best. Exactly. So I guess the, yeah, the 3D rendering thing is, but what do you say about the, now I'm at a restaurant with the intention of going with my three friends and catching up and having this human experience. One of the few, you know, places where we can still go and just be together and present but I'm now looking at my phone. And while I'm looking at this awesome 3D rendering of my steak frites, 
I get a text from my ex and now I'm, oh, I'm now I'm feeling weird and, or I get a notification on Instagram and now I'm checking that and I'm off on a tangent. Like that's actually what bothers me about the QR thing. Yes, <laughs> that's a problem. So I ultimately when it comes to tech and I think when it comes to consumer tech and believe me, I can talk to you and we should talk about the ugly side of this, which is oh, very extreme, right? Uh, I think when it comes to being present with your friends and using tech in a way that benefits your restaurant experience, but then having either your do not disturb on so you don't get notifications or having the discipline to then put your phone face down or put it back in your pocket afterwards, like that's it more and more. I mean, this isn't a restaurant problem necessarily, right? This is a social omnipresent pressure that we all have to navigate together. Um, Weirdly, restaurants um, get picked on for this, whereas it's not the case in like every other social setting. In my living room, I'm hanging out with my friends and we're all on our phone. You ever look around and you see your friends, it's like one, two, three, four, everyone's looking down. It's like, what? (laughs) Exactly. So this is, this is what's difficult. Uh, And I, I'll tell you also when it comes to TikTok, right? Like I've been living in TikTok world for the last six years, right? Um, So I have seen, and this is really interesting, where I have spent the last six years, right, um, living in China, marketing and distributing alcohol and consulting on hotels, bars, and restaurants. Yeah. So in that process, with our suite of independent brands, we have to figure out how to market to people. So you take the Western playbook for a spirits brand. What do I do? I'm going to buy you glassware. I'm going to pay for some events at your bar. I'm going to print new menus. I'm going to buy umbrellas for your patio, right? Well, normally in the Western context, that works. The problem is that it's relatively low value ad. You have no way to know. Like if I sit on that terrace and I see an Aperol umbrella, do I buy more Aperol spritz? It's kind of hard to say right? So I have seen one day in our office in China, one of our marketing teams said, hey, a lot of our accounts are telling us not to do events for them. They're asking for this other thing. They're asking for us to pay for influencers on their local TikTok uh, in their community to come to their bar, do a one of those videos Hey guys, so I'm here, I'm in the city and I am doing a night out at this cute cocktail bar and here's what I had, A and B and C. We started with the margarita, you absolutely have to get the burrata. <laughs> yeah, we started yeah. We started with the margarita, we got the pork tacos, you can see blah blah blah. And it turns out that for a bar or a restaurant, there's a tremendous ROI to having that and you can see it right away. And that content sits on the platform and marinates. And so it's not like if I do an event, so let's say I, I'm, I'm a rum brand, right? I go and I sponsor a tiki party at your bar. You are, you know, you've got guest traffic for that day, maybe the day after, maybe some people went and had a good time. The problem is that they didn't have a good time actually doing the thing that you do right? I came, I went to the tiki party. I had the tiki cocktails. Okay. Well, we don't usually make tiki cocktails. We do this other thing. And you're like, Oh, I I don't, you know, okay, I'll try it. It's a bit of a problem, right? It's a huge problem. It's like billboard attribution. It's, uh, you know, you never really uh, have the ability to trace it back. Um, when you're, when you're brand building, but you can still say they had positive experiences. So it's still valuable. It's hard to draw the line exactly. But yeah, I see the the TikTok thing. So that So TikTok's been prevalent in China for, you're saying, I guess it blew up in the States in 2020. Right. So in China, it's already been raging for years. Um, But I've also seen the social transformation that comes behind TikTok, which we're starting to see now, right? We're starting to see the Mr. Beasts of the world. We're starting to see all of these uh, influencer wannabe types that go to like hot restaurants that are just popular on TikTok and taking, you know, recording content. Well, when you go to China, where it's more years developed, now when you poll young people, what do you want to be when you grow up? The number one answer is a social media influencer. Because people see like, 
You live the lifestyle. You get all the money from brands. You can just go to the gym and look beautiful all the time, right? So uh, that's the the um, the projection of people uh, that are young there and and here and increasingly the whole world. So what happens is uh, you go to a restaurant that's popular on TikTok in China. You call it a wang hong dian, which means uh, a sh- uh, a bar restaurant that's fire online, right? Yeah. Oh, interesting. A wang hong dian, and so uh, or it's like red, red meaning like red hot. And so if you go to one of these bars or restaurants, it's packed with just influencers and they will bring like, so let's imagine I'm the influencer. I bring my buddy who has a suitcase and a camera with them. The camera is to record all my content and you, what's in the suitcase? Outfit changes. So what happens is they will. You're kidding me. No, 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 not a joke. And this, I've seen this. I have a lot of friends running different bars and restaurants in China and you get mobbed. Oh, our Instagram influencers that are like taking a picture of their eggs Benedict on Saturday don't hold a candle. It's nothing. In China, this is so much more large and professionalized. They've got a whole film crew and outfit changes. That is insane. I have seen, so I used to have this little Italian place uh, in the on the block where I lived in Shanghai, and I would love to go there and just work sometimes. But eventually it got to the point where I couldn't get one of the street-facing tables because those were the hot tables to take photos and videos at. And you would see a, a couple cars pull up, eight models would get out, they would order a bottle of wine, an Aperol spritz, a pizza, the pasta, all the stuff that's like hot online. And then all of them will stand curbside and take turns taking their photo and video content with that food sitting at that prized seat and nobody eats it, right? And it just gets cold and then they just get in the car and just drive away. It's purely a content shoot. Oh man. And so for the for the restaurant, they're like, how do I give service and hospitality to these people. Like, how do I, uh, I have a friend that works in a French restaurant in Shanghai and um, he had this ice cream dish that went viral and these influencers would come in and order the ice cream dish and take all the photos and videos and then would wave over the waiter. Like, excuse me, the ice cream melted. Like, could you send us another one? He's like, he's like, yeah, it's ice cream. It melts. I don't know what to tell you. No, (laughs) no. If you buy another one, I guess. And it's just to record the content, but that's, that's the world of, of that's very interesting. It's the logical next step for better or worse. And so you think we're following that curve. All right. Well, if you remember the original question was, what are the th- two things that you would oh, like to see? Ado- no, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> adopted. I-, I like this tangent that we went on, even though it makes me a little bit scared for what's coming. But um, there was there was one being the more dynamic menus where you can kind of see what's going on. What What's the second thing that you think we should adopt here in the US that people already do in China? The second is um, in the States, uh, we are heavily regulated, uh, especially when it comes to um, restaurants, food and beverage, especially when it comes to alcohol. You're talking about the guys that come and put an A, B, C rating on your thing? like That's health code regulation, and that's good regulation. You won't ever hear me say that, that health inspections are a bad thing. But one thing that I thought was fascinating, and I wrote a lot about this in the pandemic, is um, the concept of to-go cocktails and to-go alcohol. Yeah. Now, in the States, all of this, we have a lot of baggage when it comes to alcohol, when it comes to alcohol regulation and all of this. Um, and in other places in the world where there's not necessarily that social baggage in the same social context... Because of our relationship with alcohol, because people abuse alcohol, because people drink too much and kids are jumping off of the balcony onto a table in college and posting it online and stuff like that. And that's why I say this is spicy, because it's really hard to separate the realities of regulation from the realities of a social context. And so things that work in one society may not necessarily work in another society because of all of these important cultural differences. However, when the Yeah, I guess you can make the argument that 
look how much regulation there is and look how wild and crazy things are, even with this regulation. Or you can, I think, take the other side to say, if you loosened up a little bit, and I mean specifically with like, you know, our drinking age being 21 and it being so hard to buy spirits in places like I used to live in Virginia, you had to go to a government regulated ABC store that oh, that was super strict about IDs. And it's like, is that actually what's forcing people to rebel the same way as you tell a kid you're not allowed to have any chocolates and he all of a sudden wants chocolates? That's exactly right. And so th- a lot of the regulations that we have in the States, they have sociocultural roots, they have religious roots, they're rooted in like the founding of our country. And so I, it's really hard to go out and say, you got to get rid of this and get rid of that and restructure it because these are all intertwined. You could also make the argument that, you know, you look at other societies in the world where people start maybe casually drinking at a younger age, but then also have perhaps less uh, uh, binging and abusive behavior. That's a whole slippery slope that's really not my wheelhouse because I'm I'm not a, a you know a, a sociologist and I'm this is deep deep waters. That having been said, the net effect is that when the pandemic rolled into China, um, a lot of bars were able to pivot to pivot to delivering bottles of booze and and cocktails and things like this. And the reason that I say pivot in quotes is because they were already doing it for years yeah, yeah, with no meaningful consequence and, and with beautiful to-go bags and all of this. And I, it, it's, it's difficult because I see in China, for example, a lot of bars are able to make more money for themselves as a small business uh, because they have different avenues of revenue. Whereas in the States, we really regulate it and say, this is a bar, this is where drinking happens. And we have a lot of, in my opinion, it's overregulated. I would love to see that come back. We had it, yeah, we had it a little bit in COVID when people were really desperate. New York did this thing where the bars could only serve uh, booze if they also served food because you weren't supposed to have just like just bars. And so they would give you like a bag of chips or popcorn. And there were, I remember a few places in the West Village that would actually do the to-go thing, the pouch thing. And so you'd grab it, you'd go to the park. And for a couple months, it felt like almost this like European, I, I'm more experienced than in Europe, I'm sure. It sounds like uh, in China and in Korea, it also exists. But like, that was a really nice thing. So, uh, but I guess the society caters to the lowest common denominator. And so because one person can't be cool and can't, you know, handle their liquor and decided to get behind the wheel or do something stupid, uh, I guess we all have to sort of follow that. And yeah, I guess that is a, a deep rooted cultural thing. Yeah, yeah. It's and like I say, it's deep waters to swim in. Like anytime I get into the discussion of to go cocktails, people are so because on one hand, of course, you can point to negative social consequences. On the other hand, of course, you can point to small businesses that are able to make more money. And then on the hypothetical third hand, you can hear all kinds of positive experiences from people that say, look, like I went to that bar, I bought some to-go cocktails. I went, I safely consumed them in the park with my friends. I discarded of the waste properly. And I was an adult that could make my own decisions in a way that wasn't socially harmful. So I think like, I, I, it's a space that I feel particularly passionate about because I have so many friends in the States that run bars and restaurants. And during that small window of time, when in New York, you were allowed to do to go cocktails, they were making money. And then Part of the issue is that you have lobbies, like let's not pretend like this is just purely a social question. You have lobbies. Why did the lobbies fuck it up? Because if you're able to buy to go cocktails from a bar, then you're not going to the grocery store to buy a full bottle of spirit. So what you're doing is you're screwing up the supply chain. And if you screw up the supply chain, you're also undermining all of the advertising that goes into influencing the decisions that people make when they go to the grocery store. Got you. And so this is where it becomes a governmental thing. And you're saying there's the, maybe the lobbies to, to, to circle it. I mean, to, to bring this full circle, it's like in the East, the lobbies have less control over the government. Is that, is that fair? Well, there's, 
there is no lobby in China. It's a one party system. So it's just, if there is, if, if people get unhappy, like they just change the whole government. So yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, all I'll say is that it's a very interesting and very different social system. Uh, and some of the net effects I think are very reasonable. I want to talk more about content and your uh, recent foray into TikTok, I think, as your main medium. But is this something that comes natural to you? And and before I go any further, let me just play a video so that people are familiar with the different types of content that you put out on your page. And, uh, and then we can go into a little bit more of like the abstract, what you think about brand building in general. And uh, I've got some fun questions for us. But why don't I go ahead and pull this up if I can figure out how to do this without fucking up. Janae from hey, Janae. And All I'm right. going to teach you how to make an old fashioned. Love an old fashioned. Old fashion, Let's go. You need bourbon. Yes. Maraschino cherries. <laughs> Not correct. Orange slices. <laughs> no. Bitters. All right. Back and on. then you We're can either have track. regular sugar cubes or you can use simple syrup, whichever okay. you'd like, depending on good, how good. sweet or if you want a little bit more liquidy, liquidy or your preferences. Not a word. But so we're going right. to start out with our glass and we're going to take our you. orange slice wedge. Yes. Slice her away. And a cherry or two. I it's, like to use two cherries. No. Just give it a little bit more cherry flavor. Fingers right in that we're jar. We're going to go ahead and huh? also grab a sugar cube. Same hand. So you'll see you have your orange, your cherries, and your sugar cube on the glass. Yeah, and your you're going to mash all of that finger up. Finger oil. Make sure you get all the sugar. Janae. Janae, is that a wooden spoon? Everything good and mashed. Okay. Okay. Resourceful. Resourceful. If you don't have a muddler, as you can see that I don't. You do not. Basically, anything works. A wooden spoon end or whatever it is that you'd want to use to mash it up. All right. People can keep watching. I think that that mostly does justice to the video. I think you go on to ask and make sure everything is okay. (laughs) Blink twice if you need help. Yeah, exactly. On Chris's page, we'll we'll show maybe one or two other ones, but I have a couple questions specific to Janae. First of all, how did you come across this person on TikTok or definitely not on TikTok, but somewhere in the internet? I am a old user of the internet. I grew up in like the e-bombs world era. Uh, I've been, you know, hanging around these kinds of pages for a long time. So this, these kinds of things that are like best of the worst, you know, are always a treat. Um, And these videos first surfaced, I want to say back in like 2014. It has to be. Yeah, I was going to say 2000s, like the the, the early 2000s. Yeah, it was uh, about, I don't know, 10 years ago, let's say. And uh, it it was a couple of us in New York and the bartender cocktail community, at least in those days on Facebook, was really tight. And so uh, one of my bar mentors named Souther in New York found that video with a couple friends and it just exploded in our little Facebook community. Oh, so you've been sitting on this for a while. I wouldn't say sitting, but it has been living in my head rent free for eight to nine years, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> and what is Mahalo? So for people that haven't seen this, hopefully you've watched maybe a few of these videos before, but there's always this website, mahalo.com, that she promotes. I went to mahalo.com. It doesn't exist. No, mahalo.com does not exist anymore. Maybe it did at one point, and she was a representative, that, and, and they were in the business of promoting cocktails. <laughs> Here's as best as I can summarize. I love a good shit show, okay? Now, the definition of a shit show is you have to have uh, not enough resources for a overly ambitious project that not enough people know what they're doing, right? And so Mahalo.com was this group that was like, we're going to be the next Google. And the way that we're going to be the next Google is we're going to make a library of proprietary content as cheaply as possible and host it on YouTube and make our own search engine like a closed loop search engine that only feeds back to our own content that we can sell ad revenue on. Stupid idea. Right, we can all agree this is very stupid. This is in 2014. Yeah, yeah. This this would have been like 10 years ago, man. And so, um, so Mahalo.com, you can if you look them up on YouTube, they have whole libraries of different kinds of content verticals. They've got like yoga classes and cycling classes and cocktail content. So what they did is they hired this 
woman, Janae, who was uh, a bartender slash aspiring actor living in California. And they went to her bar and said, do you want to do a gig for some extra cash? And she said, yeah. They took her to a warehouse where they gave her 50 cocktails a day for two days. And it was just a printed Excel sheet of just stuff that they found on some random Google search. And they gave her one bag of ice, almost no tools, a couple crappy bottles, and just said, go for it. Okay, but the, to be fair, Chris, the the supplies are hardly the problem here. It's <laughs> it's not like there's not the right type of thing. Like she's got the ingredients and then some on the table. It is a perfect storm <laughs> where you've got the ingredients and the glasses that don't necessarily make sense. But then layered on top of it, you have Janae, who is thinking in her mind, maybe I can use this for my actor reel, right? Maybe this footage is useful. <laughs> so rather than just make a real old fashioned that's down here, she said, well, I've got a glass that's this size. No one's going to ever watch this stuff anyway. And let's just go ahead and make it look like it made sense in that pint glass. So, and then also all along the while, she wasn't set up for success in, in, in Janae's defense. She's not set up for success. <laughs> she's not set up for success at all. And then at the same time, she's just smiling through it so she can use the footage. I love it. That's the best part for sure. And so it's like this, it's this kabuki mind fuck where you're what, like, it's wrong. You're sure that she knows it's wrong, but her expression and language is saying, Everything's okay. It's like the meme with the dog drinking coffee while the house is on fire. Yeah, yeah it's, it's fine. It's yeah, that yeah. in video format. Well, and then that, when you take all of that and then juxtapose it with this sort of like knowledgeable, I don't know how, but when people see your face, like you do command, like I've been there, I've done that. Hospitality is also such a detail oriented domain where like the small things matter and she's like not even getting it right in broad strokes right like <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> oh man so so suffice to say like that series has been successful you've done a ton of those videos pretty much i assume run it back for where are you finding the the library of content because mahalo.com is did you download them in 2014 you're like I'm going to I'm going to need these someday. <laughs> All 100 videos are still sitting on YouTube. You're kidding. And originally, I did the first old fashioned one and I thought, well this is funny and then we'll just do something else. Then I started watching some of the other videos and I don't think anyone so I'm a big fan of bad movies, right? I'm a big fan of like I used to watch Mystery Science Theater 3000, yeah, I Rift you're Tracks. One of those. I listen to how did this get made religiously. I love the room. So I love like a, just a, like the perfect storm of shit, right? Yeah. And so I started watching through this library, which I'm not really sure anyone has ever meaningfully done. And I started to realize it's not just the old fashioned video. There is, there is a deep mint julep is my favorite. Mint julep is by far my favorite. Because you've got the wand. Oh, <laughs> Mitch Phillips a trip. You've got to see, uh, I love the fruit loop, which is just, it's so as she's running out of ingredients through the day. Special she, K. So as she she's pulls running, Kahlua for everything. <laughs> Kahlua is the answer to everything for Janae. Dude, so good. As, as she's running out of ingredients through the day, they just switch to the next uh, ingredient that looks similar. So, if you've got, uh, so the Fruit Loop, for example, should be blue curacao and milk. Objectively, that's a stupid, disgusting drink, right? So already set up for failure, but then out of milk. So you, so she just switches to a carton of heavy whipping cream that they have. So it just pours a pint with a straight face and a beautiful smile and nothing's wrong. Blue curacao, no ice and a full pint of heavy whipping cream and just puts it forward and says, and that's the Fruit Loop. For more recipes, come visit us at mahalo.com. And you're like, what is going on? Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Okay, so that series took off. You did the thing that good content creators on TikTok do, which is something works. You run it back 
as many times as you can possibly do. The familiarity people love, and it's it's this compounding effect that the more people see it, the more people want it, and you actually don't have to do that much. This is my observation, and you you can say if that was your experience or not, but that's kind of been my no certainly uh, observations from from operating on TikTok in the space of of modern social media. People love a series. People love. Uh, you know, the format, right? And that's not a new thing, right? You think of a sitcom, right? Think of Friends, think right. of House, every one of these. Think of uh, SVU. Yeah, House, it starts with uh, what what happens scene and ends with him saving them or rarely something bad happens or whatever. Always, there's, there's the same predictable arc. So that's really nice. And then uh, what's exciting is that Again, people are coming for the things that I think are funny and, and we have some fun with this nonsense together. And then we can get into educational content and and content about building bars and restaurants. Yeah, which is which is really cool because I've I've recently started speaking. So I work for a VC full time and I uh, we have a portfolio of founders that we support as well as just a community that we t- try to engage with. And this topic of like content, building content as a brand is really topical. Everyone wants to talk about it. It's hard to get right. But when it's right, it's easy to point to and be like, oh, these guys crush it. And I think the two things that you can do on TikTok these days are or, or content more broadly are make people laugh, which you've done, and then make people learn. Anything else I don't really think plays. Like promotional shit just doesn't do well. And I know you've you have strong opinions there too. Before we get into more broadly talking about like content and how it plays into brand, curious to get your perspective on that stuff. I'm gonna show another one of your clips that's uh also blew up about so this was a, a classic like super viral video where the numbers I assume watching the numbers go up was just kind of a mind fuck of like every time you look at your phone there's 99 plus notifications like this crazy thing that happens on TikTok. I guess you stumbled upon a video where this guy's making tequila uh in somewhere in Asia and uh you stitched it so I'll show the video and people can watch. What a cool video to understand the process of making tequila and mezcal. So here we're in, it looks like central or southern China. So you can't technically call this tequila, right? Because it's not made in Mexico, but it's the same. Agave actually still grows there. It's not typically distilled, but this guy is going to make an awesome looking distillate anyway. Um, And ultimately, look, you take that koa, you take that spade tool, you cut off all of the leaves to get at the heart of the agave, the piña. You wouldn't call it a piña in southern China, right? You call that long she lan xin, but that doesn't really matter. It's the same thing. And ultimately, split that. You see that fibrous, dry pineapple looking uh, fruit in the middle. And then that has to get roasted. So, this is the big flavor difference between mezcal and tequila. In tequila, you would steam the agave, so it's a lighter, cleaner, fruitier flavor profile. In mezcal production, typically it's this more artisanal, smoky, slow roasted process. And that underground roasting is actually what makes me this guy's a g i i will I'll, I'll let people watch if they want to continue he goes on to make it into i guess tequila there's a boiling situation that happens if i can make a couple observations that we'll talk about kind of how you got into this series but you've managed to thread this needle like we live in a world where people are very sensitive to mansplaining oh yeah and you're doing things like saying if it's not from a you know Mexico, it can't be tequila or agave or whatever the thing that you said. It's like the classic: if it's not from champagne, it's not technically champagne. But you somehow managed to do it one in a non mansplaining way, which I think is a huge accomplishment. Uh, and again, I think it goes back to sort of like the knowledgeable credibility that you establish when you first show these videos. And then the other thing that I love about your page is you've created a system where your followers now know you. Oh, every time I see a ridiculous video or an interesting video about drink making or hospitality, you've got this like, you know, almost like team of scouts that are scouring the internet for cool shit to go tag you in and then you make a video. So it's like this, you know, that's a hard thing as a content creator is like, what's my next video going to be? I imagine you've got a backlog of a few things that like, oh, I could go, you know, this person tagged me. And so those, those are two things that jump out to me. I'm curious to get your take. Sure. So I think first is how to 
be educational in a way that's not aggressive and confrontational, right? And that's, you're exactly right. It's, it's hard to do. I've been leading spirits educations for, I'm going to say 10, maybe nine years, nine, 10 years. Um, and it's how to say a big part of my personal journey in my life that I will continue to walk down for the rest of my days is just how to be curious, how to not lead with ego and how to be helpful in a way that's not, um, forcing onto you something that I think is interesting and it has to be done this way and shoving it down people's throats. Right. And so there's, you know, uh, that's a practice I think is how to be, um, how to add value without being aggressive. And uh, if, if it's working for people, I'm happy. If, you know what I mean? That's pretty much all I can say. And you get a pretty instant feedback loop that it is, you know, that that's the good thing about TikTok and things like that. I've spoken at whiskey show. I mean, I've spoken at dozens of whiskey shows, especially uh, selling spirits in China. Right. And, and I think it also comes from years of being humbled where I am. This is, does it, does it get any more harrowing, right? Like I'm a, a Caucasian man from the U S living in Asia, selling imported products to people who don't necessarily need them. And I think that it comes from just drinking a big glass of humble and starting with, first of all, nobody needs this, right? Nobody needs what I have to say. If it's valuable, then that's great. Um, but I want to be careful and make sure that it's not something that is, uh, it pushes to the point where, where it becomes unhelpful. Um, so then let's extrapolate further and talk about, I guess, how has blowing up on TikTok, you've got a hundred thousand plus followers. Now you've got tons of people that probably recognize you. Uh, and have seen your stuff. And that has probably converted to now you run a hospitality consulting business. Now, the vast majority of those people aren't uh, uh, prospective clients of yours. So uh, the conversion is not necessarily, you know, a perfect sort of marketing funnel, but I have to imagine it's led to positively uh, to your business or to opportunities or is this just something that you do for fun and and yeah let's let's talk about that for sure earlier in the chat today we talked about the things that i learned about how tiktok is used to market businesses successfully in china and so while living in china i really was able to closely study and learn that playbook also my wife michaela her company gaishan consulting they do brand strategy for brands who want social media strategy for brands who want to get onto TikTok and Discord and all of these modern platforms. Got it. And so I've been able to learn from her. I've been able to learn from my own lived experience. And so coming back to the States, I said, hey, guys, this is what's coming. TikTok is here. Here's how you're going to need to change the way that you market your business. And people said, yeah, 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 yeah. But that's China. And what do you know? And so ultimately, what I came to realize is that nobody trusts a skinny chef, right? Nobody trusts a skinny chef. If you're not doing it, if you're not in the space, you're not going to have the credibility. It doesn't matter if you've lived it or not, right? So I just said, look, whenever I'm going to practice what I preach, I will grow a TikTok and not grow it for growing sake. I've, I've really loved the journey of getting to know a lot of the people that follow the channel and people who comment and you're providing real value and education. Things like this. Yeah, totally. How do, how are spirits made? I've got a whole series planned that we're going to get to that's all about bars, restaurants, hotels. I've got some really exciting projects that I'm going to take people down the journey from like totally start to finish of how do how do you build a bar? How do you build a restaurant? From I have a space in New York City to I have a a finished bar that people could patronize. That's going to be like an eight month journey and and we're all going to go down it together starting in a couple of months, which I'm really excited. That's awesome. So if you're interested in that, subscribe to the TikTok channel. This is my plug for myself, but we're all going to get there together. And so you, you do get to lead real education 
And at the same time, you get the benefit of having a halo that when I talk to clients and I say, look, like invest your money with us because we're going to build you a bar or a restaurant that has a serious, modern, effective social media strategy. How do I know? I'm in the space. I've done it. We got yeah, 150,000 yeah, yeah. people, right? That's awesome. And and to be specific, I guess like you're you're touching on this difference between how social media used to be and how it is now and how it operates in China. You're getting it. What is it though? What is that difference that we're living today um, that about how you have to operate and how you have to put on put out content? Yes, the big difference uh, with social media and how it used to be versus how it is. It used to be that social media was a space. Oh, and this is talking back to our discussion about ego. Yeah. So it used to be that social media is a space where I talk about me. Here's my product. Here's my dish of fancy food. Here's a cocktail with my booze in it. This is a feature of my product that's going to help you or whatever. Me, 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 me. I don't care about you. You follow me because I'm pretty. You follow me because I'm delicious, et cetera. Now, modern social media, people are sick of that. They say, look, I want real. I want to know who you really are. I want to know the human story. I want to be able to have an open, honest, transparent discussion, right? I want to, I want you to take me along a journey. Why should I care? Why should I believe in you? And if you're not entertaining, educating, and inspiring me along the way, I don't care. I don't care about you, right? So, the, the way that businesses then have to pivot in this space is if you're not, you need to think of yourself instead of a celebrity, you need to think of yourself like a magazine or like a TV channel, right? People sit through the commercials because they like the show, okay? So if, if I subscribe to your car magazine, it's because I want to see cool car stuff. I'll flip past some ads and that's okay. But you need to keep me entertained and engaged if I'm, if we're doing a platform, let's imagine, let's imagine that I'm selling, uh, that I'm selling, what's a good example? Art supplies, right? I'm trying to do a painting company. I'm not going to be like, my paint is the greatest. I'm going to be like, here's a tutorial for how to paint at home. Right. Here's a great way to paint with your kids. Right. And paint is a good example because it's the, like many products these days, I mean, every product to some extent is kind of commoditized. Yes. On one extreme, you have like a water bottle or cream cheese or whatever it is. Like these things, they exist and people buy them because of their affinity to the brand, not because I prefer Dasani to Avian or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, I think it applies to pain and it probably applies broadly to brands. Now, where you have a little bit more product differentiation, you can probably get away with a less forward uh social media strategy but i can see how especially in hospitality this is just such an important thing even the brands that are well differentiated if you want to win right now you still need to build a meaningful community and a lot of brands still misunderstand that and they're like yeah 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 it's a community of people who love my product and you're like fuck you it's not it you need to build if you're not delivering real value to people from the content that you produce then you you have no business existing in this space. Right. And the if everybody could read like two books about just that, it should be Tribes by Seth Godin, who was just ahead of this moment. And I think if that book dropped now, everyone would be like, oh, I get it. He did a, a thousand true followers or something. He didn't write that post, but he talks about it. And that's part of the inspiration for the book Tribes. You're right is talking about a thousand true fans and talking about like how it used to be that we were in one bubble of content and it used to be that we had 10 channels to choose from and you kind of get what you get, right? And so it's, uh, it's all about the ad. Whereas now we no longer really care about mass media, right? Even look at TV. Now it's Peacock, it's Hulu, it's all these little, and that's going to get tighter and tighter and tighter as people like TikTok is such a great example of this as a modern platform because it's not grouping people based on here's the most famous person, which is what Instagram does. It doesn't care about who's a real world celebrity. It cares about your interest vertical, 
Like I'm really into hockey, let's say. So suddenly I find myself through looking at TikTok, I'm in like hockey TikTok, right? And it's feeding me all these videos and there's going to be normal people who aren't, no one says you are the person who's going to speak for the hockey community in terms of fans, but people implicitly vote through their attention, their their likes, their comments, their shares, their engagement. You're implicitly voting for who do I want to hear from? Who do I feel like uh, speaks for me or or speaks from a, a perspective that I can relate to? And that's, if you're not giving those people value, they don't care about you anymore, right? And and nor should they, right? Because what are you doing for them, right? So if that's that's modern, and if brands aren't doing that, then then they have to quickly. Easy to say, I think hard to yes. to to take the opposition. It's hard to operationalize, and it's hard to focus on that while you're also focusing on building an amazing product and going to market and all of this and hiring and all that stuff. Of course. Anyways, that's it's great to get your perspective on on sort of the ban- brand stuff. I want to just because I want to give us enough time to go over uh, the main objective for today, so you can kind of uh, come full circle on a bunch of the stuff we've talked about. But um, how would you say you know? Let's let's start at the most basic question. So like the the topic that we started with, which was the three most critical things to know about when building a restaurant. And obviously, now that you've kind of shared a little bit about your background, uh, you know, people will listen to what you have to say. Yes. So I came back to the States and started a company called LTH, Louder Tascarella Hospitality, with my very old friend, Jeff Tascarella. He used to be the general manager of the Nomad Hotel in New York when we won all of our awards. He then became the COO of that company. So running 11 Madison park uh, operationally and then all of the expansions of those hotels around the world right um and we said look let's let's do what we do and and do it together so now our business is people come to us they have an empty space um in a building somewhere and say look i want to turn this empty space into a profitable bar or restaurant or hotel and we take them along that whole journey not a lot of companies will do that uh, from creatively concept a space to do the financial modeling to select all of like the plates and knives and find the chef, et cetera, et cetera, to the marketing strategy, to the staff training, to the grand opening of own. We'll even operate it long term. Yeah. That's what we do. So the three big things when it comes to actually uh, putting this together, number one, first and foremost, and any fan of Shark Tank is going to know this right away. You got to know your numbers and financial modeling, the number of like running any business, but especially food and rest beverage and restaurants and bars. um, You have a lot of people that get into this business from the creative side, from I love to cook. I love to go to bars. My friends love coming over my house and we host. I want to do that for money. Well, really doesn't necessarily work that way, right? You need to know your financial model inside and out, and that includes the terms of your building. It includes partnerships you bring on, who's taking percentages for what, uh, are you modeling for the seasons? Pricing the menu items. Pricing the menu items. What kind of food are you going to serve? If you decide that you want to do a taco stand or if you decide that you want to do a fine dining restaurant, like it's a wildly different financial model and you're going to need different staffing and all this. So modeling from the ground up that business ahead of time and really stress testing that model and making sure it's conservative is number one. And it's where a lot of people get screwed up. People say, oh, like, isn't it true that one in three restaurants die really quickly? And yeah, because it's it's a kind of low barrier to entry business model, right? Everybody eats, a lot of people drink, uh, you know, you can go for it. So it's it's making sure that you scientifically have some understanding of what you're doing before you get started. Secondly, I'd say is what we call the golden thread, which is what's the concept? Like clearly, what are you building? And it's easy to say that, like, I want to do a steak restaurant. Okay. But like, why? Right. That's the second book is Simon Sinek. Start with why. Right. Yeah. 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 Why are you building it? And why should people care? Right. We just got done talking about social media and, and how it, it, everything needs to be delivering value. 
What's the story that you're trying to tell? Why should you be in this space? We talked earlier about mansplaining and a little bit about cultural appropriation, right? You got the two, the two dudes from, you know, suburban, uh, whatever, suburban Wisconsin that are like, I want to start a Thai restaurant. Yeah. Why? Right. <laughs> like, what are you adding to that space? What are you contributing? What are some stories that you've seen out in the wild? Cause, cause this stuff is, feels abstract to me. I'm like, okay, a restaurant, I go to a restaurant to eat food, not to learn about a story, but I'm sure there's something subconsciously that attracts me to the ones that can do both deliver a good food experience and have that story. Like what's, what's an example of someone who's done a good job telling a story? Great example. Let's talk about 11 Madison Park, right? 11 Madison Park won best restaurant in the world while, while we were working for that company. And so the big difference is originally you had 11 Madison Park run by Danny Meyer next to Tabla and people would go in grand, beautiful space. And Danny said, I want this to be a brasserie. I want you to be able to come in here and just get steak free or whatever. The problem is that that was a conceptual mismatch. You had this beautiful room downstairs from Credit Suisse headquarters, and you had this uh, cuisine style that was just aiming to be like approachable and whatever. And people said, I, I don't get it, right? So that's a fuzzy mismatch. And the restaurant, ultimately, he sold it, right? Now, when Will Gadara and Chef Daniel Hume took it over, they went through the process of refining it. And eventually, the concept that really took it over the top was, we're going to be New York. We are going to be like, let's get into the history of New York. Let's get into every little dish. Everything should Every little piece of whether it's the menu or the picnic basket course or whatever, all comes together to tell the story of uniquely New York dining. And people got it. They said, oh. Was this the, the, the reopening? Was it documented? There's a Netflix series called like 10 Days Out or 7 Days Out. Is this what you're talking about when they reopen? That's a different uh, menu launch. And that's after they did a close uh, and I think at that point, they were number three in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so they did a relaunch, but they were already heavily New York, New York before that time. Uh, and they kept just telling that story and telling that story. We did a bar in Singapore called Atlas. Uh, they went on to be one of the number, you know, top three bars in the world for many years. And again, grand iconic building. What was in that space originally was they were like, we're going to have a wine tower. If you buy a bottle of wine, there's going to be a girl dressed as a fairy that's going to uh, rope herself up the wine tower and fetch your bottle. And it didn't make any sense. Everyone was like, what is this, right? It's just gimmicky. And that's the difference between a gimmick and a concept is a concept gets deeper and deeper and deeper as you explore it. You say, ah, that's a story you can tell. It's funny. I think I can I can experience it. You walk around New York City and I laugh to myself when I pass two restaurants in the West Village that have like almost identical menus or vibes or experiences. They're in the same location, so they get the same foot traffic. One is packed on a Tuesday, one like doesn't have a single soul eating there. And so yeah, I think that that is maybe the the real life example of one being able, well, there's probably promotion that goes into it. So that maybe that's where you're going next. But the third thing to know with building a restaurant or a bar or anything is how are you going to market it? Right? Yeah. So it's like the story and then telling the story, telling the story. Yes. So you've got to start with the story and part of the story also, there has to be a story. Yes. There, there must be a story. And also what are your goals? And you could say like, my goals are to make money, but like, that's not necessarily everybody's goal. And especially once you have different investors that are coming together to invest in your space, they all have their own different ideas. And so you really see this when you get into the restaurant and bar development is suddenly four months in, some investor is like, by the way, there's going to be a cigar room, right? And you're like, well, we're building a Thai restaurant that's, you know, like, right. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it doesn't, and the guy says, well, I'm investing a million dollars into this space. How are the the structures of these? Is it like uh, from a decision-making perspective, first of all, are the investors typically institutional or is it like just wealthy individuals? It depends. It depends. It depends. And and then what what is the structure for 
board and decision making and things like that? Like, do you have a board seat structure where there's the, the biggest investor gets to make the call about the cigar room? A, a lot of this, and this is again why people need to have this low level level of alignment when they begin, is because you need to talk to your investors. You need to have a very clear understanding of who's who's doing what, who has how much influence. I understand you're investing this, but yeah. Let's imagine we're hiring the best chef in the world, right? To come in and make seafood, the best seafood chef in the world. And then one of the investors is like, yeah, but I, you know, I want to make sure that I can have spaghetti and meatballs. And you're like, well, dude, you know, that's not what we're building. And it leads to these, again, egos and voices ultimately come together to lead to a fuzzier and fuzzier concept. And then that is often a big cause of failure because once the concept is fuzzy, it's impossible to market. And, and, not, and marketing is not just my marketing it to other people outside. Marketing is that person that dined goes and tells six of their friends, hey, I went to this great restaurant. What was it? If you can't give someone a six word elevator pitch about what your concept is and have them remember it to tell their friends, then your restaurant is dead. Interesting. Because people can never recommend it. Do you find that most consumers are perceptive to this stuff? Like, I certainly don't think about this. This is all news to me. I'm learning that there's this much thought that goes into restaurants. It's almost like when you study film and you're like, you know, I saw the movie, but I didn't really see the movie because I didn't take into consideration all the details. Do you find that people are perceptive like that? Ultimately, when uh, when you walk into a bar or restaurant and it's really done well, you shouldn't see any of the work that went into it. All you should be thinking is, wow, this is great. Wow, I'm comfortable. Wow, I'm glad I recommended this to my friends. Now I've got some social cred and we can sit and eat and drink and have a great time. So when this is done to the world-class level, it's all hidden behind the scenes. And that's why a lot of people open a restaurant and fail, right? (laughs) Because they don't know that there's a million details, right? When you watch a movie like The Room, and you say, how did this get so bad? It's, it's due to a <laughs> utter misunderstanding of the work that goes into making a real film. Right. We didn't have our story straight. We fucked it up. We fucked up the story. Yeah. There was no script. You know, you didn't have a camera. You didn't have all this. Exactly right. So you you really, and and when you get to goals of, of building a restaurant, like some people, and you'll find this out real quick, there's a three-piece Venn diagram. There's spaces that make great food and drink. There's spaces that make a lot of money and there's spaces that win awards. And there's overlap between all three of those. At the center of all three of those circles is true greatness. Very, very rarely is a place actually delicious slash has a great vibe, et cetera, et cetera, actually makes money and actually gets awards and recognition. Right. Yeah. And and you see this if you go to like, let's say you go to the best bars in the world list, like look over the last 10 years, like how many of them closed? Right. And it's again, some people open spaces. Enter Chris Louder. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, we try our best. But if someone says, look, like because there's people to whom money is no object, there's people that say I am happy and they come to us. They say, I don't care if this ever makes money, but I use this space to attract investment for my hedge fund. Uh, All I want out of this is I want an award-winning restaurant that I can take my buddies to and I get a halo of success because they say, wow, if you run this well and you got a Michelin star, then you must really be a guy that runs successful operations. I want to invest in something else that you're doing. And so you got to be really clear about that because you also have to make sure the team's on board because suddenly... Like you have a somebody that's like really sweating the bottom line and like, no, I don't want to send out comped food to our, they get really pissed off when the investor comes in, but the investor's like, dude, I just built this specifically so that you could send my buddies free food and make me look cool. That's all I want. Yeah. 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 Comp them the caviar and the champagne. Yeah. 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 And for some people like that's success for that project, because that project is for them, the whole business is a marketing investment into their real business, right? For other people, they're like, no, no, this is, I want this to just quietly print money. This is the business, yeah, yeah. 
I don't need to make a fancy cocktail. I want to sell people high life and chicken wings and I want to just print money and I want to like use that money to buy a yacht and travel the world. Cool, right? That's a whole different set of goals. And therefore you hire a different chef, you buy different plates, you have a maybe a much bigger marketing strategy, maybe you have less staff, right? And, and you have to configure every piece of the puzzle differently to lead to a different specific outcome. And that's where our team comes in. That's what we help people do. Sounds fucking hard is what it sounds yeah. like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, every project's a different puzzle. Yeah, that's awesome, man. That is really cool to, to hear a little bit about your perspective um, and what goes on behind the scenes of obviously dined at hundreds of thousands of restaurants or whatever, but um, getting your, your perspective on this all is awesome. Uh, that, that was very academic. I think we learned a lot. Uh, I think so to sum up, we've got the finances getting, sh making sure you've got the, the sort of not the PNL, but like the, the financial model, uh, and the numbers straight. Sure. You've got having the story down and then being able to tell the story yes. via marketing. That's it. Amazing. Those are the three big pieces. After that, it's, you know, there's a thousand more details, but if you've got those big pieces aligned, you're, you're pretty far down the road. Chris, can we close with, uh, well, I'll give you an opportunity to plug anything that you want to, but can we, can we close with a restaurant and hospitality smasher pass? Yeah, sure. Let's do a restaurant or hospitality smasher pass. I love it. All right. These are rapid fire. So I'm going to shout them out. You let me know what's good. Uh, all right. Ready? Yes. Interesting. We talked about this. QR menus. QR menus, smash, comma, you don't let it be a flat PDF. Got you. Uh, if done right. Metal straws. Metal straws, smash, comma, make sure that you're following proper hygiene protocol because otherwise that's gross. <laughs> it really is. I have a, let me tangent for a second. I have a gross metal straw story. Uh -oh. It was my buddy, my coworker at my old office. We used to have like communal stuff that you could share. He was hung over one day, came into the office, grabbed a cold brew for his first meeting, sat down, pulled a metal straw and was like sucking on the straw. Nothing was coming out. So he like, of course, you know, puts a little more force into it. And out comes, I guess, what was like a curd of something from a smoothie the day before. So gross. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he went home after that. Uh, so yeah, okay. That's very interesting that you make the point about the hygiene. So uh, metal straws, assuming you're, you're following proper uh, cleaning techniques. Good for the environment. I know you're big on that. Uh, sushi hand rolls. Sushi hand rolls, pass. Pass. I, I think they get soggy. I don't think there's enough spaces to really enjoy them. I think it's more of a lunch item. Do they exist in Japan or is that an American investment? Uh, in, uh, they do exist. Um, and it's like more quick snack, right? So I think uh, if it's a quick lunch snack, I think that's tasty. But a couple of people have tried to pitch me on doing a sushi hand roll restaurant. Um, to partner in and I, I pass everyone because I don't think there's the market for it. So it's only fair that you pass room service, room service, smash, comma, overlooked space. I think that room service is one of the number one spaces that you can tell a story about your hotel, about the bars and restaurants. And everybody phones in it. Really? It's a chicken Caesar salad. It's bullshit. I hate it. I hate something about eating wings and I'm like sitting on the edge of my hotel bed eating hot wings about to go to sleep i hate it all <laughs> do you know why it usually sucks this is a behind the scenes thing for hotels room service so bars and restaurants are usually run by a director of food and beverage room service tends to get championed by the hotel manager so you got two oh, different people running different like hotel manager runs it's not just the same food they serve in the restaurant but they put it in those stupid like metal top things Often it's a, it's a different staff. Even it comes from a different room service kitchen. And often it's run by somebody who is primarily focused with turndown service, uh, laundry, guest check-ins. So it tends to be a blind spot. And I think it's one of the biggest low hanging fruit where hotels can really inspire and tell stories to their guests. Yeah. You have a good room service experience. It's, it's memorable. Yes. Especially if you're on like real vacation, not like work travel. Room service, it's like if you go to a restaurant and it's got a great bathroom, right? Because you, like when you go to the bathroom, that's the time that you're not talking to your friends. You actually get a moment to decompress. If the bathroom is dope, you're like, this restaurant's great. 
if the bathroom's a shit show, you're like, th- like there's no toilet paper and it's dirty. You're like, ugh. So like room service, it's the same story. I'm by myself. I'm in this zone of decompression that I can actually take in a, a moment of service and hospitality and everybody whiffs it. Few and far between are the spaces that actually crush. I love that take. Let's keep it rolling. Froze. Froze. Smash. It's delicious. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. 100%. You can't go wrong. Sushi conveyors. Sushi conveyors pass. Uh, even I've been to like Kaiten Sushi in, in Tokyo. Um, it's never high quality sushi. It always sits and, you know, it gets kind of sweaty. It's not my vibe. I mean, I like the, the, yeah, like you count the plates at the end and that's your bill, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a pass on sushi conveyors as well. Eggs on a burger, egg on a burger. Egg on a burger pass, to be honest with you. They're goopy. They're drippy. I think it always gets on your hands and you have sticky yolk. Um, (laughs) I think I, I like a, I like a tight, well-constructed burger. Love that. Oyster shooters. Oyster shooters smash. Oyster shoot oysters are delicious. I think um oysters in general, like there's a lot of interesting shit about oysters that people miss. I actually made cocktails in Shanghai for a I never knew this existed. International oyster shucking competition is like a whole underground. It's like fight club. Oh, interesting. And all these guys know each other from like Canada, from New Orleans, from France, and they come together and they do heats. And it's like watching a movie where everyone's drinking. Everyone was like shit faced. It's three in the morning. I'm with a bunch of international champion oyster shuckers and they go, okay, me and you, we're doing it. It's like arm wrestling, you know? And they're like, who's, who's going to be the judge? Someone's like, I'll do it. And they go back there and it's a speed shucking. How many are we doing? And they inspect to see. Shucking is when you remove it from the ground or shucking is when you, when you pull it out of the shell. And they, how fast can you do it? Ah. Did you fully sever um, the the little ligament, whatever, that's holding the oyster to the shell? And did you puncture the belly? So are they pre-shucked when I have them at the restaurant and they're sitting on ice? That's They've already been shucked. Pre-shucked. Got it. Yeah. So there's an oyster shucker. And what I learned, which is awesome, is that if you eat an oyster, gills first, which is the thin part that has the greenish bluish color, Right. That's where the oyster is eating all the algae from. So if that's the first thing that hits your tongue, the oyster is has a complex minerality and taste of the sea. If you flip an oyster, and this is sacrilege in some oyster circles, if you flip an oyster and eat it <laughs> belly first, if you eat the fat wide part of the oyster first, it's fat and creamy. I recommend anyone listening to this, have bread, really good bread, bread and butter, and put on top of that a belly first oyster. That bite will fucking blow your mind. Love. Let's see, this is exactly why I brought you on, Chris. Uh, all right, we've got a couple more. Let's round us out. Umbrella cocktail picks. Umbrella cocktail picks pass. They were cool and then not cool. And then they got cool again 10 years ago. I think now it's not cool again anymore. Kill them. Natural wine. Natural wine pass. I think it's a. Uh, uh, overstated category, I think, and a lot of people are going to give me shade for this. I think um, the right wine from the right producer is delicious, whether or not it's like a quote unquote natural wine. These hipsters are getting carried away, basically. Well, a lot of winemakers will tell you, dude, there's a reason why you call it winemaking and not wine watching. Like, like there's, there is a craft to making wine. And so I don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. There's a happy medium in there. Bloody Maria. Bloody Maria, big time smash. Delicious. Like, I mean, tequila, te- tequila's savory in a way, and Bloody Mary is already savory. And so you've just like, you're adding them together. I also recommend a Bloody Mary with Akavi, the Scandinavian spirit that has uh, like caraway and fennel seed in there. It's delicious. Maybe you can make one for your collab with Janae. Ken, why not? Let's do it. I love it. All right. Well, Chris, thank you so much. Anything you want to plug before we uh, have to wrap today? We're all unfortunately out of time. Uh, first off, thanks for having me on. This was awesome. Uh, anyone that wants to follow this whole journey of building bars and restaurants, we've got some really exciting projects coming up in New York uh, at from LTH. And I'm going to be taking people through the whole journey from start to finish on my TikTok. So it's not all like Mimi nonsense. We do a lot of Mimi nonsense. But if you actually want to see what it's like, uh, follow the channels. It's all Get Louder Now, G-E-T. 
L O W D E R N O W. I'm the same at on all platforms. Please uh, do follow. And then secondly, if you're a brand and you want to win on TikTok and modern social media strategy, look up Gaishan Consulting, G-A-I-S-H-A-N. And that's run by my wife, Michaela Piccolo. And uh, she is an absolute wizard. She's crushing it for her clients and give them a follow, reach out to her and, and she'll help your brand up. Love it. Well, I look forward to the series, Chris. I will look forward to the collab with Janae and all the amazing stuff you've been doing on social. It's been an awesome pleasure meeting you in real life. Thank you so much, buddy. The pleasure is my Rashad. Thanks again for having me on and, and take care of yourself, my friend. 